Uh, today, what we're going over is just how to break into real estate investing, uh, strategies to overcome fear and adversity in the market. I don't know if you guys heard the news or on social media, but a lot of fear going on out there. So we're going to talk about some strategies to overcome uh, all that stuff so you can you guys can start or, or continue your investing journey. Uh, but for those who don't know us, uh, my name is Calvin. I got my wife, Jenny, on the line as well. Jenny, you want to do a quick intro for everyone? Yeah, so my amazing husband, Calvin, we just got married in Singapore and been able to fly out our family out there and live a life that we want and travel the world and also help a lot of families. Um, and that's what, one of the things that drive me to get into real estate. And I was actually able to help retire my parents last year and move them out from New York out here to California and gave them housing and gave them a car. And they worked in a clothing factory from... Uh, when they immigrated it from China in the early 80s until last year, working 14 hour days, seven days a week, and just seeing how much stress that put on their bodies and their mental health, I wanted them to get out and see the world. And uh, I was able to do that last year and fly them to Singapore and and we're excited. We're taking them to Hawaii in a few months to our retreat center. And then uh, we're going to take them, them to Barcelona at the end of this year, too. So that's just some of the story and the visions of like why real estate and why we're doing this. And we want to be able to give back and teach people on how to unlock your potential on being able to do the same thing. And whether it's taking out your family and just being able to see the world or just being able to not have to worry about money um, on a day to day basis. So just a bit of background, I'm a San Francisco Bay Area real estate agent. I came from the tech background, worked at Oracle for a few years out of college and bought my first house at the age of 23 years old and rented out the rooms and house hacked and was able to pay the mortgage with, um, my, with that rental. And that property went from 870,000 to now about 1.5 million in just a few years. And back then my salary at Oracle was about 45,000. I was based in commission, but I was like, I'm making more on my equity growth than I am in my whole salary. And all I have to do is rent it out and someone else is paying for the mortgage. And I was like, this is genius. And how come not everyone is doing this? And I think there was a lot of fear. Oh, I'm too young. Um, I'm just a female. I'm by myself. Like I don't don't know if I can do this. I don't have enough money. Oh, I need to save 20%. So there's just so much fear. Oh, you, what if you can't make the mortgage and all these things, but the power of real estate is that we can do so much and be able to leverage from it and use it as a vehicle to be able to grow our wealth. And I actually feel like I'm so much more blessed to be in the position I am because I don't have to worry about, Hey, am I going to get laid off or um, am I on the chopping block or, Oh, my stock's all went down from my tech company that I'm working in. So I have to work harder or something, but now we have like the passive income that is pretty much like a, there might be some expenses here and there with like ACs breaking or other things, but we have a pretty set income coming in that we don't have to worry. So the things that we're doing is being able to give back and teach others to be able to do the same. So that's our passion. And um, a little bit other background was awarded 30 and 30 National Association of Realtors. Uh, we've helped over 500 families. Um, now actually like close, like across the country, um, probably closer to 800 to 1,000 families in their real estate journey. And our goal is to be able to help more uh, we've I've sold over, uh, we currently own 230 units across different states from California, uh, recently Hawaii, Texas, Alabama, Tennessee, Missouri, and Utah. Um, I think that's all currently, but we have students who have invested in Indiana, Ohio, and every single state, um, almost every single state in, except for like Alaska and some of the Wyoming's <laughs> that are not as high growth. Um, we have over 30 million of assets in our portfolio and have over $30,000 of net passive income coming in every single month. And we use a variety of strategies. We're not flipper investors um, because flipping, it is a full-time job and we believe in really buying and holding or at least like um, doing exchanges on properties. So we've done single family investment, burrs, which is buying, renting it, uh, renovating it, renting it out, refinancing and um, 
and then repeating. And then short-term rentals, so that's Airbnb, VRBO. We've also got into midterm renting and we just got a, um, a great deal on a midterm rental for with traveling nurses and corporate housing. And then we have apartment complexes and recently a wellness center in Hawaii. And then I'll pass it back to Calvin. Yeah, what a great intro. I am just her husband. Uh, I'm the guy in the back doing the numbers. So, uh, you know, my greatest accomplishment is just being able to, to marry Jenny. And uh, that was the toughest negotiation of my life, but we got it done. And anyone that is married probably knows that that is the toughest negotiation you'll ever have. Um, but, uh, you know, just to echo what Jenny said too, I mean, you know, I think we love being in real estate, not because we love talking about uh, HVACs or toilets or gutters or cash flow or anything like that. It's because, you know, it's the people that you meet along the way, right? It's never about the money. The money is, is a byproduct of all that stuff, but um, really the, the relationships that you create, the experiences you create, the lifestyle by design that you create, that's what we're all here for, that this is just a vehicle, right? That we're all trying to create and use this vehicle to do the things that we're more passionate about, right? And um, I think what, what gets a lot in the way of, 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 of you know, starting your journey or, or continuing the journey what I found, I guess, personally, is, is that fear aspect, which I, why I thought it'd be such a powerful topic to talk about today, because I think fear is that number one thing that stops people from going out and, and taking action, right? So what we're going to be talking about today, a couple of things. One, when we go going over a lot of data, right? And so that you guys can make data-driven decisions, we'll be going over case studies, what are some actual strategies that you can implement, and then we'll do uh, some Q&A at the end. Um, so... What is fear? What is adversity, right? So, you know, that's what's actually what's happening in the market right now. You hear every day there's war, there's, you know, bank failures, there's tech layoffs, there's, you know, things like that. And, you know, what I always like to say to people is that fear, what it is, let's just honor it for what it is. Um, it's something that's an emotion that we all have as human beings, right? Um, you know, if you ever meet an investor that tells you that they have no fear, you you're, you probably should run the other way because they're probably lying to you or they're probably aliens, right? But it's really just a mechanism, right? That that protects us, um, you know, from making bad decisions, and it's there for us, right? If you look at it like that way, versus something that is, you know, something that is so crippling that you want to run the other way, then that's what's going to be very powerful. Um, and so, and what are, what is adversity? Adversity to that point are just roadblocks that stand in the way of what you're trying to accomplish. So maybe some examples in real life, right? Fear, maybe you have fear of bungee jumping, but why do you have fear of bungee jumping? Because you're literally jumping off a freaking bridge. Right? Your body is telling you, hey, 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 like that might kill you, right? Um, so thank you, body, for, for giving me the defense. Adversity in real life might be maybe you grew up on the wrong side of town, right? Um, and that may be something that you have to, a roadblock that you have to get over, right? In real estate, I know for us, uh, for me personally, uh, fear is maybe that I've never done this before. Maybe that I look too young, right? Or maybe I don't have enough capital, enough time, or anything like that. A fear of financial ruin. What if I do a deal? and I lose all my money, right? I still have that fear to this day, right? Adversity could look like interest rates, right? Interest rates are up, right? I have a lack of capital, I have a lack of time. These are things that we're putting in our own mind as a roadblock that may or may not even be true, but they're there, right? And if you choose to say that it is true, then it is. If you choose to say, all right, that is a roadblock, but how can I get around it? Then that's true too, right? And you always find a way. So. Why well, I always say to get around the fear and adversity aspect of it is, is knowledge, right? Knowledge is what I think really breeds power, right? It breeds confidence, it breeds empowerment to actually go and take action. So, you know, uh, it's really the ability to take information, internalize it, and then make strategic decisions from that, right? Um, versus, you know, I think when, if you guys, anyone here own a primary house, right? Like I know I do, and I'm sure a lot of you guys do too. We buy a primary house. It's ninety percent emotion, ten percent logic. I remember when we bought our primary house here. Uh, at the time, we were living in San Francisco in like a six hundred square foot apartment, and um, we were looking at a house. But we went to an open house, and literally our master bathroom was bigger than our, our our whole condo at the time. And Jenny was like, "Hey, we're buying it." Was that the most logical decision? Probably not, right? But emotionally, it felt really really good, right? Um, investing is the opposite. Right? When you're looking for an investment, it should be the opposite, right? 10% emotion, 90% logic, right? And so uh, what we're going to be talking today is we're going to be talking a lot about data, a lot about charts. Um, you know, if you don't like looking at, if you don't, don't like looking at numbers, then I'm sure there's a new season of Stranger Things out on Netflix that you can watch. 
right? But today it's gonna be purely educational. And there's a lot of news out there right now that, you know, uh, you know, that could be real, could be fake, but everyone has their agenda, right? So what we wanna do today is peel that back, go over data, right? Everyone is gonna be in different positions. Everyone is gonna want different things out of real estate as a vehicle, right? You're all gonna have different, you know, financial situations, risk tolerances, lifestyles, uh, things that you wanna achieve. So use today's data uh, how you wish and, and be able to, my hope would be to, for you to be able to make your own strategic decisions from there, right? So we're gonna be sharing a lot of that in the next hour. Take it, make your informed decisions. What we'll be answering questions at the end, and always happy to help out uh, in the future if uh, things are lingering on as well. So, what's been good uh, these past six months? Uh, I put interest rates on here, right? But again, I don't mean that to say current interest rates, but we'll, we'll talk about past interest rates. Uh, we'll talk about inventory. We'll talk about equity. We'll talk about how how real estate is so regional, right? Um, so let's look at it, right? So interest rates. So again, I'm not talking about current interest rates. I think. Anyone here would say, well, what are you talking about? Interest rates are so high right now. It's, uh, it's making it unaffordable for me to do deals. Um, from well, actually, what I'm talking about is the interest rates from 2020 to 2021. Right? You can see here on this curve, this, this graph here, that uh, what's, the, what's, what's the notice? What do you guys notice there? Right? You notice that the rates were been really, really low. Right? And so when the rates were really, really low, what happened? People bought a lot of houses. People refied their houses. Right? And so... Uh, at the end of 2022, 62% of mortgage holders had a rate below 4%. 82% had a rate below 5%. That's insane, guys. 82% of the mortgages are below 5%, right? And what that means is essentially like, I think I saw a stat the other day. It was like 11, there's $13 trillion in debt out there. But $11 trillion of that debt is below that 5%, which means that a lot of people have very affordable mortgages, which is why what? They ain't selling, which is why inventory is really, really freaking low, right? And, you know, just showed out, I'm going to show you guys a few different markets out there that kind of represent that, right? So San Mateo County is a county that we live in. You can see here, uh, February 2023, I think it was uh, in the whole county, about 480 homes were listed, available. Uh, February last year is around the same, but then February 2021 was at 675. Right? And you can kind of see the seasonality as well. But for the most part, a pretty low inventory uh, across the board and accounting for a seasonality. San Mateo, the city itself of San Mateo, there's only 80 homes, 80 homes available in general, like for the whole public to buy. Like that is not a lot. And it's because a lot of people refine, right? I'll take a different approach, but we were just in San Antonio, right? Texas. So you can see here too, right? So again, they had a huge curve where Pre-pandemic, you know, there was a decent amount of listings, right? There about 7,000 of listings there, right? And then they start to curve down during the pandemic. And then during 2021, there was almost no inventory, right? Now it started to creep back up a little bit, right? But versus pre-pandemic uh, inventory, still very, very low. Almost half of pre-pandemic inventory in general, right? So what does that do to affect home prices? Well, uh, obviously peaks and valleys here, but you can see that home prices are still above the 2020 ranges and, 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 and before that too, right? Even in San Antonio as well, you can see more linear curve, but a lot higher than it was pre-pandemic as well. And so I told you guys one thing, when mortgage rates go up, houses do what? Most people would say, oh, houses probably go down, right? But actually, if you actually look at the data, and I'm talking about looking at historical data, not like what uh, analysts are saying in the future it's going to happen, but like if you just look at the data from 92 to 2022, when mortgage rates go up, historically, house prices have gone up as well. I thought this was super, super shocking as well. Um, really only after the 0809 crash that house prices kind of correlate with mortgages going up. And the reason for that uh, is, is that there's a lag effect, right? So why, is, why, do, why do the Fed raise rates? They raise rates because things are getting out of control. Like economy's on fire. So they need to slow things down. Right? So what's been happening in the last few years? The economy's been on freaking fire. Right? So the Fed's like, all right, well, like things are getting crazy. Inflation's really happening. So we need to slow down the economy. Let's raise rates. The one thing that we can control so that you know, things can slow down. But there's a lag effect to that. right? Because these last couple of years, what, what is, there's been so much money in the economy that's been spurned. So many new companies, so many new evaluations, so many exits, so many IPOs, right? That also had a lot of money to spend on, on prices and drove that up. And so you can see here, like in the graph that, yes, prices typically correlate with higher interest rates, meaning like most of the time, they actually prices go up too, 
which I thought was just a crazy, crazy stat. And because of the booms in the last years, right? Like, if, uh, you know, there's been so much equity built as well. Uh, 74% of people estimate they have more than $100,000 of home equity. 20% estimate they have more than $300,000 of home equity, right? And there's just a lot of people that have equity. So it's different than 2008, 2010, when, you know, people just didn't have equity in their houses, right? And when, you know, everything went crazy, right? And people... Uh, we're starting to, you know, not cash flow, right? And, uh, you know, they didn't have any equity in their properties. They just let it go. Right? They, let the, they said, hey, bank, you know, you can just have my keys. Right, right now, that's not really happening because there's so much equity. The home prices would have to come down significantly, right, to be in a, in a, negative, situ a negative equity situation right now. Right? And you can see here just in data-wise, right, like equity over the last, was this 50, 60, 70 years, right? So the amount of equity people have in their homes, Yes, there was a dip in 08, 09, but you can see it go straight up from there, All right? So if you guys look at this and you guys can type this in the chat or, or get up, come off mute, what do you guys see here? What, if you just see this, this whole chart right here, what does this mean to you? Okay, no, anyone, anyone, Ryan? Oh. As you can say, it shows us there's a ton of equity right now, much more than there's ever been in history. So probably a greater cushion for, for sellers to just hold on. Yeah. 100%. I love that. Christine, what do you think? Yeah, definitely a lot of equity. So is are you saying it's a combination of low inventory and then also with inflation? So that means obviously things are going to go up in price, but how, how home costs, right? The value, because the value of the dollars went down. So then it'll take more money for like, you know what I'm saying? So is the equity from inflation and low inventory or... I just yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a combination, right? So I think what the inventory does, it, it keeps it from really taking a hit, right? Like uh, it keeps the home prices from going down a lot, right? Because where is you going to move, right? But it also keeps it from people from wanting to sell too, um, because they're like, all right, well, if I were to sell my property, even if it's at this price, where would I go, right? Uh, a lot of places right now, even, you know, uh, even a mortgage might now maybe more expensive to rent, uh, rent right per month. So you got to kind of figure that into your, your equation as well. But um, it also means something too with the higher interest rates and high equity. It also means a lot more trapped equity, like trapped money too. Right. So it's harder to refinance. It's hard to do HELOCs, right? Because that's expensive money, right? So there's less people even in demand, right? Because uh, you know if I were going to use a refinance to finance my next property. I might not have that ability because I don't want to go from a 3.5% rate to a 6% rate, right? So what does that mean? It means it's trapped there, right? Not doing anything. And, and if people don't want to take it out either because they don't want to sell and they don't want to refi because their cost might be more if they you know, try to go to somewhere else. So it's a good thing overall because it just means that there's, I think in the residential space, it means that there's going to be a very continuous uh, way of keeping values there, if not pushing values still more with inflation as well, uh, dollar being less. Uh, definitely means it pushes hard assets uh, like real estate forward. Now, let's talk about the bad parts about this, right? So the bad parts about this is a couple of things. One, uh, obviously the government's doing a lot of quantitative tightening, which means that they want to suck money out, which is kind of what I just talked about. Like, you know, having higher interest rates makes it harder for you to access capital. So it's quantitative tightening. Uh, commercial loans are at huge risk. And when I mean commercial loans, I mean like things, assets of office space that we'll go over here in a second. And we'll talk about interest rates currently as well. So let's talk about quantitative tightening, right? So again, uh, government wants to fight inflation. They want to, you know, fight unemployment too. Right now, they're prioritizing inflation over unemployment. Uh, so the Fed fund is hiking uh, rates so that they can take money out of the system, right? This does what? It affects mortgage rates. It affects banks. I don't know if you guys live in the Bay Area. You see a lot of these banks going underneath right now uh, because they bought a lot of bonds and because they bought a lot of bonds and because rates went up, those bonds became way less in value. And when people you know, were asking for their money, they just didn't have them. So they had to sell these bonds at, at a loss, right? And um, that also affects mortgage rates too because the less banks there are, especially the regional banks, um, you know, they typically are the ones that give the best types of loans out there too. So that's affecting just mortgages everywhere, right, in general. Uh, how does this affect real estate, right? So I talked about commercial real estate, right? So one of the big things that I, I we have in commercial real estate people look at is what's called debt service coverage ratio or DSCR. So back in 2021, banks were like, hey, we'll take a 1.2 DSCR, right? 
Now they want a 1.3, which means like DSCR is essentially your annual rent divided by your annual debt service, right? So you had $100,000 in rents and you had $100,000 in your mortgage every year, then your DSCR is one. So they want that annual rent to be actually 130K versus your debt service of 100K to be a 1.3 DSCR. Now, because DSCR also includes what? It includes your mortgage in there as part of that equation. Then with mortgage rates going up, what happens? It's harder to hit that DSCR. And so a lot of banks, more and more black banks can't actually uh, loan you unless you buy for a lower price or you put way more money down. But what we said before, a lot of people aren't selling at a lower price because they don't have to because they have you know, cheap debt on their property, right? So that's one aspect to look at. But the other aspect is that cap rates are, are going up because of this and that means values are going down. So also like you're not gonna be able to sell at the desired price as well. So that's commercial real estate. And the other aspect of that is that because values are going down, I mean, regional banks, community banks are getting shot out of the water, right? Every day, uh, you know, there's, I think there's an estimate of $1.5 trillion worth of commercial real estate loans that are due to mature over the next two years, right? So what that means is a lot of these guys got like bridge debt loans, which means that, you know, maybe it's an 18 month, a 36 month loan, right? So, and maybe they got in 2020. So now it's 2023, that loan is coming due. Right. So typically what they have to do is they have to refinance that or sell it. Right. And guess what? If they had bought for you know XYZ cap rate and now the cap rates are up, they may not be able to sell even at the, the prices they got it at, right? Depending on how much work they've done and how much rent they've, they've increased. And a and a big issue right now, in my opinion, what I can see is like an asset like office space, where if you live in San Francisco, like right, I know you do, right? Like, you know, half the office space is empty nowadays, right? Uh, I think prior to the pandemic, it was like 95% uh, occupancy in office space, which is awesome. Today, it's like 47%. Right? I just, I, I, would just help, I just heard a story about a building in San Francisco that was worth $300 million pre-pandemic, and now it was worth $60 million. It's like an 80% decrease in value, right? And so definitely something to look out for there uh, in terms of what is you know, potentially a, a, a big risk. Um, Again, inflation interest rates are always something that we should always talk about. Interest rates right now, about 6.5%. What that does, it just it crushes affordability, right? So even in the residential space and trying to buy a house at 3.5%, maybe your mortgage was three grand and now it's a 6.5, maybe it's five to six grand. That's a big difference every month. Um, but the interesting thing is the US economy added 236,000 jobs in March and the un unemployment rate fell to 3.5%. Right? So we're not technically in a recession because our unemployment is pretty low. Right, which is super, super interesting. But inflation is coming down, which is great. I mean, we were, I think, I remember like late last year, we we're in the 10s or something like that, or eight or nine or something like that. Now we're back at 4.9, the Fed target is 2%, right? So, you know, the thought process is that the Fed is still gonna continue to increase rates until our Fed, you know, our inflation target is closer to that 2% range, which again, I don't know how realistic that, that actually is, but um, they're gonna try to keep on nailing it down. But this is a real estate talk, guys, right? Not about uh, the overall economy. So what does this mean for real estate? So uh, so what, what kind of actions? So quick mindset aspect of it. You know, what, what kind of actions do you, questions do you ask yourself, right? Uh, you could say, hey, why is this happening to us? All these tech layoffs, oh my God, the world's going to crap. I'm going to go hide under a rock and just wait it out, right? Or you could say, hey, okay, okay, cool. Well, what opportunities are there that are presenting themselves right now? Because, you know, there's a, you know, if you had bought a place in 2020, right, in that, that little range of like from April to September, you're not very, you're not very mad about that right now. Uh, you're, pretty, you're pretty happy. But a lot of us were thinking about, I don't know, why is this happening for us? Like, why is this oh, pandemic thing? Are we going to turn to zombies? Right? Not asking ourselves, hey, what opportunities are there right now? So I encourage all you guys on this call today to say, all right, like things are happening, but, you know, what does that mean? For real estate, what does that mean for my investing strategy? And it's crazy because right now home prices are actually staying flat. In Q4 of 2020 and 2020, it was the medium home price across the nation was 358K. In 2021, medium home price is 423. In 2022, it's 467. Right. So it's still going up, which is crazy. The 10.4% increase from 2021 to 2022, year over year, uh, nationwide. Um you know, there's articles, you know, saying, oh my God, there could be a 20%, you know, uh, dip as mortgage rates, uh, you know, start to rise. 
potentially we'll see right but i would say you know if anything i look at this and i always look at this and what jenny mentioned in the beginning too is we're not flippers right like we look at real estate on a long-term basis meaning that we look at real estate like we're not going to hold it for six months to a year to two years like we're buying real estate you know hopefully to keep that for a long long time right and if you look at this graph this is the median home price for all homes in the united states in the last 50 years can you guys look at anywhere where the in the decade it started at somewhere and it ended lower? You can't, right? Because even in 2000 to 2010, right, that was probably the worst, you know, decade, right, of the economy, right? Because you had two major busts, right? Um, you know, you can see in 2000 here, right, in 2010, still higher, right? So as long as you're looking at real estate on a long term basis. Really, what is there to fear, right? The only fear that you should have is, you know, the fear that you're putting in your own mind, right? I'm more scared nowadays that I didn't take action, right? And I didn't at least try, right? So why you say, hey, you, what is, you know, how do you get over fear? It, use data, use data. So what is, okay, let's say a 20% decline, how, what would that mean, right? So let's reframe how we look at this data. So a 20% Decline would mean a greater decline than one that was during the 0809 crisis, right? Which again, that was a mortgage crisis. This is not a mortgage crisis, right? Um, medium home prices in that range went from 257k to a 208k. That was an 18.9% decrease, right? Um, in real estate, it's outperformed the S&P 500 by over 25% in 2022, right? So just looking at what real estate is compared to other assets. So even a negative growth of 10% means that you're still, your, your property value is still 17% more valuable than it was in 2020. So even a negative 10% growth means that you are still up 17.35%, which is a pretty good return, right? So again, just looking at the same thing, you know, sales price uh, for the last, you know, since 2019, still way higher than it was pre-pandemic. Like way higher, right? I think, <clears throat> I think people forget that. <clears throat> so why, why do we still have a bullish view on real estate long-term? Well, one, there's been excess savings thanks to a lot of money being injected in the economy in 2020, 2021. Like I talked about before, under supply of a lot of homes um, where you know the vast majority of people have less than a 5% rates on their homes. So it's not that supply. I don't think it's going to be coming back to the market anytime soon unless there's distress. Um, you know, there's going to be, uh, can you do capital shifts from assets uh, that are like funny money, things like stocks and crypto back into real estate, especially as an inflationary hedge, like Christine mentioned. Uh, the average credit score of borrowers for new mortgages was over 720, which is, which is why, you know, a lot of people don't think it's like the 0809 crisis, but also there's been a huge amount of equity built over the last few years, right? So home prices would need to fall by over 40% to have the same proportion of homes underwater uh, that happened in 2008. 40%, which is, again, never been done in 0809. It was 20%. That was the max. So, so what, what type of opportunities are there right now? Well, because of higher interest rates, right, uh, it is making cash flow harder, right? It's making affordability harder. So, uh, and the other aspect is banks are getting tighter or lending, right? So, less banks, less regional banks that give the best term, terms in general. Um, you know, people moving a lot of their money to JP Morgan Chase or Wells Fargo uh, just means that they have less money to lend out as well. So again, is this a, a, an opportunity to go lay down and take a nap or is this an opportunity to say, what is the opportunity here? And so the opportunity is here is, well, we got to solve for yield, right? So in 2020, it was high prices, low interest rates. Um, people were like, I can't buy because it's too high. Now it's, you know, prices have come down a little bit, but it's high interest rates. Okay, I can't buy it because they're, they're, the rates are too high. Well, no, it just, it's just a different thing that we need to solve for. Right, so what we are solving for now is solving for yield, solving for cash flow. Right, so a few ways to look at that. Right, one is you know finding the deal. Right, so we always look at the four Ds: death, divorce, disaster, distress. You know, people that are over leveraged. Um, I know there's 2.9 million dollars of short-term bridge debt that's going to be refinanced in the next two years. Um, so that's you know basically you know in the next couple you know years. Uh, people that have to do something with their property, whether it's a refinance or a sale, uh, that's coming up real fast. A lot of capital reserves are, are becoming more dry because a lot of banks are asking for more reserve money into the accounts and, and, and things like that. So 
you know, potentially a lot more to distract happening. So what are the, what are the strategies here? Well, some of the strategies that we're implementing is just understanding that real estate is very regional. All right, so it's regional, meaning that you can look at this bubble here and say, wow, there are some cities that are actually unaffected at all. And some cities are getting hit pretty hard, right? And the trend I kind of look at this is say, all right, well, actually there's been a lot of red in states and cities that do what? That do a lot of tech, right? But a lot of green in places that don't have a lot of tech. I think Jenny mentioned, you know, Missouri before Wyoming. Well, yeah, those are actually dark green right now. Like Florida, not a lot of tech there, right? Um, so it's kind of a, a tail of, of two, two tails there, right? Sort of two tails there. And I look at this map and I say, all right, well, you know, there are some places that are actually continuing to go up. But I also see this map and say, well, actually, this is the first time I've seen discounts in places that have tech that, you know, were booming during the pandemic, right? I lived in the Bay Area for most of my life. And this is the first time since 08, 09, I've ever seen a discount in, in prices. Right. So part of our strategy is actually we've been looking on the Bay Area, right? We've been looking at a lot in places that actually have gone down in price a little bit. So it's interesting strategy. So here, another case study that you can look at too. So one of the first case studies here is, is really if you want to be, you know, very mindful, very protected, right? Then you know, look at the markets, right? See what kind of markets are are out there and go with markets that have a lot of stability. Right. So here's a property, probably my second property I've ever done. Bought this one in San Antonio, Texas. Um, and at the time, I think the year was like 2016 or something like that. I thought there was going to be a recession then, right? Because we had been on this fantastic run uh, already. I think, you know, most cycles go six, seven years in general. And um, I was like, you know what? Like, I think we're going to a recession. I want to go. I want to, it's like a stop for buying real estate, but I want to go to a place where I know that I can, you know, uh, be protected on my, on my uh, asset. Right. So what I looked for is four things. One, I looked for good, pop, uh, positive job growth. Two, good, positive population growth. Three, good, positive wage growth. And four, economic diversity. Right. So economic diversity just means that uh, in areas like San Francisco, where it's heavily tech, if that industry goes down, does everyone get affected by it? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I live here and I could, I could see it. Right. Um, things like Detroit, right. Automobile industry back in the day. Uh, yeah, when that got hit, like houses went down like 80%, right? Um, so like San Antonio, I loved it because there's so many different industries there, right? There's military, there's um, uh, uh, insurance, there's cybersecurity, there's, uh, you know, there, there's, uh, uh, there's military air force as well, right? So there's so many different things that if one of those industries went down, uh, the other industry would pick it back up. Oil, oil is what I was looking for. So there's so many different industries that can pick each other up if one of them goes down. Right. And so what that looks like in terms of the market itself. Right. So I look at something like um, the medium home price. Right. So I don't look at the medium home price in terms of the good times. I want to see what the medium home price looks like in the bad times. Right. So if you look at this graph, what happened in 0809? Who can read that? Is that big enough for someone to read? Negative 0.26. <clears throat> Negative 0.26. Right. That means if your property was worth 100 grand, then it was, it was worth 98.74%, 98,740K, right, the next day, right, or that year. Is that really a big difference? No, not really, right? You, you know what Detroit was? It was literally like negative like 40% or something like that, right? So really good stability there. And why is, yeah, because high uh, percent of renters, 40%, we usually recommend 30 to 40% there. Net migration was 13%. Job growth was 2%. The housing affordability index um, is essentially was 3.79. So anything below four there, it's great for cash flow. Um, so I love that, right? So it was like, all right, my, my, my mindset there, and I don't think it's that much different than you know, what it is now, is like, I want to make sure that I get good cash flow on deals, right? So if I can weather the storm, get into deals and it cash flows, then when the economy is good, it's going to cash more and, and, and my equity is going to take off too. Right, but that's a great way to protect yourself. Just uh, insulate yourself uh, just through the market uh, that you're picking. All right, the other issue, right? So again, affordability crisis, rates are going up. Less people can afford to buy a home. So is this a roadblock or is this an opportunity, right? So, you know, case study number two is, yeah, you got strategy to solve for yield right now. So if there's less banks available to give out loans and the banks that do, 
their rates are so high that it becomes pretty unaffordable or can't cash flow, what can you do? You can take a nap or you can figure out a different way. What do you guys do? You guys take a nap? What do you guys figure out a different way? Yeah, I'm not tired, right? Um, who here has talked to a bank uh, recently and they've given you some rate and you plug it into your calculator and it's like, holy crap, how do I cash up from that? Like that should be almost everyone if you are looking at real estate at all. So that different way, what is that different way? Well, the different way is you gotta be creative, right? So either you gotta buy right and do more off market deals and find like distressed assets that you can get a discount or you gotta buy it differently, right? So I always say there's price and there's terms, right? In a market like this, you, you can't have both price and terms, right? Seller, you can have one of them, you can have your price, but give me, your, give me some good terms then on it that makes this deal work. Okay, I, you won't give me my terms and I need, a good, I need a better price. If I can't do that, then I can't do the deal. Right. So for us, uh, here's a deal that we did. Uh, you know, we, we were like, all right, well, then if we're going to do a deal like right now, then we need to find a different way to do the financing on it, the terms. So we got to find a different bank. Right. And I prefer the seller become the bank because guess what? It's not, it's not antiquated on uh, the Fed fund rate, it's not antiquated on a higher power. The only thing it's antiquated on is what? Is how much you can negotiate with that seller. So we did a deal, seller finance, a 52 unit that we closed on December 30th of the last year, 2021. Um, we got a long-term fixed debt on it, 4.75% over seven year fixed uh, with 18 months of interest only on a 30 year amortization schedule, right? And um, yeah, we did it because, right? I mean, at the same time, I was getting quotes for six and a half percent, right? And uh, tough return to, on 20 year amps. So when there's not a way to do it, you just got to find a different way to do it, right? And to negotiate that. And so a big way that you do this is, you know, and I get this, I get this question all the time about sort of financing is how do you do sort of financing? It's so easy. You pick up the phone and you ask for it. Hey, would you be open to some kind of creative financing? Yes, I would. Okay, great. Uh, no, I won't. Okay, that's okay too, right? And a lot of it too is just understanding, you know, the why. And I, if you guys know me, I always talk about just understanding why that seller is selling and are they okay with that, right? So on this particular uh, property, the seller was a, an older gentleman. I think he was in his seventies. Um, he didn't want to pay a big tax gain on it, right? Because he's he was like, hey, well, you know, if I pay tax on it, where am I going to put it? There's no inventory out there. Right, but I want to lock in the price, right? So, okay, great. Then how about we do some kind of creative financing on it, right? Where you don't have to pay your taxes and I can get the rate I want so I can make this deal work and make it yield and make it cash flow. Okay, great. Um, so again, guys, sometimes the, the answer is the simplest answer is sometimes just you got to ask for it. You know, if you don't ask for it, you'll never get it. And so on this one, um, you know, specs on this, we bought for 3.4 million. Um, it was called Lock Six Apartments, and my wife is Jenny Lock. So it was almost like, oh my God, I have to buy this property now. Um, we renovated, we're really in the building right now. We put $1.6 million down, plus with the rehab, uh, renting all the units at market value. So we're going to increase our net, uh, our net operating income from 174K to 355K a year. That brings the value uh, with six and a half cap. The cap rates have gone up to about 5.4 million, right? And so if we get a 75% loan to value, then we'll get a $4 million new loan on that, and we'll return capital within that three to five year period, which means that we have no original money left in that deal and we're already cash flowing about 10K a month on this one. So, you know, that's the kind of deal that you can do if you can negotiate it and, and you find different ways, right? So yes, is there less supply out there? 100%. There's less people looking to sell? 100%. Are there still deals and opportunities out there? There are, right? You just got to pick and choose more of them and, and try to find them. So um, yeah, guys. So really that's all I have for you guys today. I mean, Again, if you ever want to learn more, um, you know, about what we do, uh, always happy to answer any questions, but um, you can always scan this QR code here to learn more. Happy to talk to want to call with you guys and just answer any questions you guys have and, and go from there. But other than that, I'm happy to go ahead and start to take questions from anyone. And um, yeah. So who's got, who's got questions? I got a quick question. So for seller financing, you, is that, that was a multifamily building. I think you're just referring to. Are you seeing this with residential, like single family homes as well? Is that common or do you get stumped by 
if they seller finance the home, then they are still faced with the banks and high interest rates. The sellers are at least. Yeah. So okay, with, with seller financing, typically your target market. So it's it's all about kind of narrowing down what's the best person for that kind of deal, right? So seller financing right. wise, you typically want someone that has high equity in their home, mm-hmm. um, maybe an older person as well. Uh, and so what that does is it allows you to sort of finance it because if they have like a huge loan on it, they bought it in 2021 and they have a 80% loan to value on it. They're not going to sort of finance that because, you know, most banks and residential are not going to want a second lien position anyways. Right. So you typically want someone that's free and clear. So that's typically an older gentleman. So if you're looking for properties and people, I use, we, if you're going to be, if you're going to search for off market people, I'd say 65 years and older, high equity, uh, 80% equity or higher in the property. That's just a better chance of, of getting people. Uh, to you know, agree. Now, I think the one roadblock that you'll run into, right, that is not a roadblock, it's adversity, right, but it's, it's something that you'll, you'll, you'll have to overcome. And as you learn more, right, is, is a lot of people will be like, well, what is seller financing? <laughs> Especially in residential space, like, what does that mean? And then you have to start to explain to them, of like, all right, first off, like, you know, what are your goals? Like, what are you trying to do? Like, for this guy, again, he, we, we still put a down payment on it, right? But I, I knew exactly how much he needed down because he wanted to take that down, right, to, to start the new, a new project too, right? But he didn't want to pay taxes on the rest because he didn't need it, right? So that's how you kind of, you know, can think of like, all right, like, you know, what do you actually want with that? Maybe it's, you know, he wanted to take that money and he wanted to go to Florida and buy a house there on all cash and right, retire there. Right? He sells his New York properties, goes to Florida, you know, keeps some cash in or keeps a, a note on his New York property, takes the rest of it, buys a, a property all cash in Florida, and retires and sits on the beach. It doesn't have to be a landlord anymore and just collects checks every month. So I don't know if I answered your question, Ryan. I kind of went on a tangent there. No, it was, it was great. It was great. I mean, like, I guess, and that answer part of it, I guess the other half of it is like, do you face challenges when explaining seller financing to residential homeowners with a bunch of equity? Or like, um, like how, does, how does that communication usually go or from your yeah. experience? So I'll tell you this much. When I was, when we, Jenny and I were just starting out, we didn't even know, we had known like high level with the concept of sort finance, but we didn't really know what it was, right? And I remember we were in the basement of this lady's house in Daly City and we were like trying to pitch it to her and we were just not even confident in knowing what the heck we were talking about. We're like, ah, you know, I think it's kind of like this and it may be that or like, you know, we'll get back to you on that, right? And it's like, you know, she like looked at us and was like, all right, like, she said it very nicely, but it was more along the lines of get the F out. <laughs> There's a door, right? Uh, fast forward, right? If you, if you know what you're talking about, you, you say it with confidence. And I just had a student that went through a, a process that very similar. Yeah, never had done a, a seller finance or creative financing deal in his life, right? Um, I bought a primary, but um, we, we shot him over a, a potential seller financing deal. And the lady was like, hey, have you ever done a seller financing deal? And he was like, uh, yeah, no, I, ha- I have. Of course I have, right? And we had recorded a video from beforehand to kind of just like mention terms and stuff. And he's like, hey, I think we should do these kind of terms, this, this, and this, right? And he said it with confidence, right? And she was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that works. Yeah, that sounds really good. Yeah, right? So it really all, it has a lot to do with just how you train yourself, right? I mean, you could say, and probably at the time when we were in that basement in Daly City, we, we were probably like 23 years old at the time, right? And honestly, we were probably just like, one, like unsure of ourselves, right? And unconfident and had fear of rejection and all that stuff and didn't feel like we knew what the hell we were talking about. And we probably didn't, right? And that probably came across very, very a lot. But that's why I say like the knowledge piece is so important because if you could speak with something with confidence, right? Like, you know, that's going to give confidence for them to say, you know what, I do want to work with Ryan. Like he knows what he's talking about. He can guide me through this whole process too. And it's not sketch, right? I think that was probably something that I've seen a lot and, you know, having conversations is, you know, some people are like, oh, is that, is that legal? Is that sketch? Right. Uh, but it's like, hey, no, I've done this a million times. I can show you all this stuff. I can show you that we actually, I'll give you a personal guarantee on it. These are the four documents that you actually need to do uh, when doing a summer financing deal. Um, I'll show you examples of that. So you see it and, you know, it just makes them feel a lot more comfortable as well. Sweet. Thank you till you make it. Thank you. Thank you till you make it. Cool. What else, guys? Marvin. Marvin and E. What's up, guys? Hi, how's it going? Hey, Jenny. Um, uh, I guess first, thank you so much for uh, giving us an overview. It's a lot of good stuff, and uh, we're like, shoot, hopefully we can take notes in the future we can absorb it. But really appreciate the time. Um, of course. We we had a question, and you know, we're we're literally 
you know, dipping our toes in and we're, you know, kind of thinking about what the future could look like. I guess the question we had, and it's a little, um, maybe a little out of left field and I apologize in advance, but sure. I was, we were curious if there was been whispers or chatters about like, you know, commercial real estate going down. Um, and, you know, those do go down, but are opportunities for purchasing commercial real estate and converting them to residential units? And if so, you know, like, what does that look like? Um, you know, I think um, we live in the Bay Area and mm. we, live, we actually live in San Francisco out, out, you know, in the, <laughs> in, in the, um, we we live out like in the sorry I'm trying to figure out a moment we're in the residential areas but okay yeah yeah right we live out in Richmond but um you know uh, inventory is so low right but people still need a place to live but all of these office buildings are are uh, empty so we're like wait a second if this is happening is there an opportunity there and um so anyways that's our stream of thought probably could have worded that much better but <laughs> no <laughs> there we I, I totally got the gist of it and it's funny that you asked that question Marvin because I've, I've had this conversation a lot because I agree with you I think commercial real estate meaning like office and potentially retail regionally right Re retail uh, especially in the bay uh, they're definitely taking a hit, right? And um, kind of that example, I don't know if you guys want to call yet on, on that one, but it was like the $300 million office building in San Francisco that's now worth like 60, right? Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, man, that there has to be opportunity there, right? So, but where is the opportunity? Like, do I feel like there's going to be more companies that are bringing people back and that we're going to come back there to get vacancy back down to 3%? I don't know. I wouldn't bet, you know, 300 or 60 million on that, right? Um, but you're saying like, hey, is there an opportunity to convert stuff? Now, I know a lot of people... Uh, during the pandemic, we're looking at converting like an office building or even a retail center or even movie theaters at the time into you know assets like um, uh, senior ho housing, right? Uh, assets like I think what I I see right now that are assets are here to stay are like data centers, uh, medical offices, right? Like things like that. But you know, office building might be overpriced for that. Data centers are typically warehouses, so <clears throat> I think that's a little bit. Harder, but if you can figure out a way to, to transform those into multifamily, again, I would say regional on this one because even San Francisco, you know, housing rents have gone down a little bit as well, um, and uh, you know, also, also a lot of like vacancy in, in multifamily in San Francisco, a lot of these new um, condos that just came online when everyone left, right? So. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think there's opportunity. There has to be. Uh, I, I I don't know what if you could figure out what would be the next asset class to turn in office class into. Uh, I think that's gonna be, that's a bajillion dollar question right now. Gotcha. We have seen some people make some good money from let's say converting um eight unit apartment complex and then subdividing it and converting them to condo conversions as well yeah. too, and selling off each condo. Gotcha. So like it, it stayed in the residential realm, realm, but you're transforming it into more, uh, more living spaces and, and stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I also say to that too, is like, like a lot of deals right now, um, they're manufactured. Like what I mean by that, like you're manufacturing the deals. Like you're not going to just go on LoopNet or like Crexy or like Redfin or Zillow and just like find the deal. Right, like it's harder now, right? Not like you know, when we're three percent, almost every deal pencil. Now you really have to be very strategic. I'm like, all right, like what is the property now? What can I get it for, and what what can it be? All right, and is that worth that investment there? And so I had to look at that and say, all right, like what can you know, if it's uh, some kind of commercial building, you're looking at what can this be? Right, like Jenny said, hey, can I can I convert these into TICs? Can I midterm rent some of these units and, and, and juice up my cash flow to account for the interest rate hikes? Um, you know, so something very strategic like that is <clears throat> where I feel like a lot of opportunity does lie still. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Right. Hey, I have a quick for one. question. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I guess yeah, not a really quick question. Calvin, I know we've never met. Uh, I know Jenny. <laughs> and yeah. Um, yeah, property management. Do you mm. man how in the beginning did you guys start off with a property manager? Do you guys self-manage? I'm, I'm sure probably a combination of both at some point and learn the good and the bad. <laughs> yeah, I love this question, man. So yeah, Lyman, nice to meet you, man. Uh, in the beginning, I think like one to six units, we were self-managing. 
it sucked, right? You're picking up phone calls and you can do like one or two properties and you can manage that and that's fine. But you know, once you get more than that, it's, it's tough. You're answering phone calls about toilets. And I remember what broke my back was like, you know, I, I picked up a call about someone's, you know, the staircase smelled like wet dog. And I had to like call like a cleaner in the middle of the night. And I was like, I shouldn't be doing this, right? It's not scalable. So then we started going third party, right? And, uh, you know, we scaled our portfolio up and to a point now where our portfolio is too big for third party where I don't, I, I wanted more control back in it. So we actually brought property management back in-house. So we hired uh, payroll, someone on payroll, right? To actually manage just our portfolio at this point. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So probably start off self-managing if it's one or two units and as you grow, make a shift. I would only self-manage in the beginning, right? If you want to learn how to do this and get your butt kicked a little bit, uh, just so that you know what to look for in a third party. And then eventually, you typically say about 100 units is like one property manager, right? So I'd probably say, you know, at that point, you know, you're starting, you're starting to look at that scale, right? Um, so. What are some good resources for learning about markets in a data-driven way? Okay. Well, for you, Abadi, you should go on, on the portal and there's a whole module on this, right? But uh, there's BEA, there's, um, there's uh, bestplaces.net, uh, a lot of these aggregate sites that you know, are on there as well, but all of these will have different, kind of, uh, different types of data that you should look at. Um, I even think that even Redfin and Zillow have really good data. So if you just go to Redfin here, um, you know, I put a lot of my book actually on. Data. <clears throat> you can actually look at data and actually customize it too, right? So you can go down here and say, all right, well, what state? Uh, I want to look at where well, you're, you're in Kent, Ohio, right? So let's look at Kent, Ohio, right? You can say by city. Um, Kent, Ohio. All right, let's check, let's check that out, right? Boom. More values in, oh my God. <laughs> up and down, up and down, up and down, right? But you can look at all that stuff. You can look at inventory, right, of it. Uh, but I love ripping data. Now, the only problem with ripping data is that it only goes to 2012. And it didn't really exist in, before that. Um, but bestplaces.net is also a good place uh, is what it has a lot of aggregate data. Um, BEA is a government site that has like GDP data, things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, if you just go on your, your, your uh, marketing module, you'll see all that, all those resources there too. In terms of like an off market campaign, are you using list source to tailor your your leads or like what does that look like from a broader overview? Yeah, yeah. So we've used list source before. Um, I've used some other skip facing guys as well. Um, so yeah, again, like you might have a certain criteria that you're looking for. Maybe it's like, you know, like I said, the 65 years old or older, you know, 70% equ equity or higher, right? 1980s build or, or newer. Um, you can even get pre foreclosures on there. Um, you can look at probate as well. Uh, so for me, I, 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 I just like the higher equity or out of state owner high equity as well, because that means they're also investors that may just want to sell. Awesome. Yeah. Working on that list now. All right. Love it, man. If you want to contact you, let me know. I have a, a guy that will do it for like, it's like, it's like six cents a lead or something like that. I'll, um, I'll message you right after this. <laughs> all right, message me right after, man. I'll, I'll shoot you his uh, email. All right. Right on. Thanks. Go. All right, Naomi, what's up? All right. So it's very, very nice. It was really interesting to, to listen to this. So I just wanted to ask you something. Are there, do you have a criteria of what you stay away from? Are there certain areas, which area do you stay away from? Mm. You mean like, where are you not going to touch? Yeah, so on a more macro level, right? Um, we don't like touching places again, like you know, market. So my my three or four big checklist stuff: job growth, population growth, uh, wage growth, and economic diversity, right? So I'll give you an example, right? So there's a town called Odessa, Texas, right? Odessa, Texas is has awesome job growth, has awesome population growth, has awesome wage growth. But what is Odessa, Texas known for? One thing: oil, right? And so what that means is that every single employee in that city, doctors, hairdressers, you know, nail salon people, they're all in the oil industry, right? So if oil goes down, that's not too. So I don't like that because that's a glass floor, right? It can crack at any minute. So those are markets that we typically stay away from. 
Um, I'd say also uh, on a more micro level, uh, don't touch any D class in Roots. I don't want to touch any C minus class in Roots either, right? So uh, my, my rule of thumb is if uh, I wouldn't allow Jenny to jog there at nighttime, then we're not buying there either, right? So, uh, and then for me, I don't like places with snow. That's more of a personal thing. Um, I just don't want to deal with pipes and, and things like that, but that's more of a personal thing. That's not more of a, you can make money in places with snow, no doubt, but that's, that's just me. Thank you. Of course. Cool. Uh, Paula, you had a question. It says, is it in the person's best interest to create a business for real estate investing, uh, ETG for tax purposes? Now, okay, so this is something that I hear all the time, like, oh, like you want to start an LLC right away. Now, LLCs aren't cheap, right? They're like $1,000 a pop. So if it's like your first property, right? I don't think it's, it's actually very wise to, to create a business for that because guess what? If you're going to create a, an LLC for your business, typically it's a uh, single member LLC anyways. So what that means is single member LLC, right? Like what's going to happen in your tax returns? It's going to go in your personal tax returns anyways. It's a flow through LLC. So if it's like your first couple properties, then I wouldn't worry about getting an LLC. Just get an umbrella policy to uh, cover your, 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 um, your, um, exposure in general, a lot cheaper. You don't have to maintain it every year either, right? Um, and then when you start to get bigger, then it does, it does make sense to actually, you know, uh, get an LLC for your, your, um, for your business. Uh, for tax purposes, yeah, one part of it, um, you can deduct more stuff, uh, especially if you start to do more partnership deals, um, syndications, things like that, you, you will need to do an LLC and a business for that. So, Paula, I don't know if you're still on. Hopefully that answers your question though, too. Uh, yeah, Rebecca, what's up? Hi, um, I'm outside. Um, I actually talked to Jenny a little while ago. Um, I have a few properties. Um, I get stuck in that analysis paralysis phase. Um, oh yeah, don't we all? <laughs> yeah, um, I actually have, what you say about the snow, I actually have two properties um, in the Indianapolis metro area. Um, and I also have a Bay Area property. Um, I just feel like I'm like, stuck um i'm kind of like running around in circles and um with the interest rates going up i'm just finding it really hard to find anything um i think i've been approaching it from um buying like i'm a primary home buyer mm. um i haven't done any the creative financing i did conventional loan i went through an agent um the last house i bought i actually bought it from a flipper who overpriced it mm, um, yeah. i negotiated a very strong offer there's a tenant moving in soon so um hopefully that'll go well um but i just feel like i could be doing a lot more but i just scared <laughs> right what are you what are you what are you scared of right now um i of being um over leveraged, um, mm. like taking out too many mortgages, um, and not having enough reserves and all the things that could come up. Yeah. Okay. I, lo I, I love this topic, right? Because this is something that probably multiple people on this call have, whether they've been or not. I know, uh, I think we all have that same fear. Now, a couple of things to unpack there, Rebecca. So, um, the fear of over leverage, the fear of uh, not having reserves, right? So let's talk about that for a second. Um, really, at the end of the day, like I was, like, I was like kind of streamlined and say, all right, well, logically, is that actually true, right? Like, do I am I am I over leveraged? Now, what is the definition of over leverage? It means having too much bad debt. Now, bad debt is defined as what is assets that don't produce income or equity, right? So first off is okay, is this asset? That I'm, I'm going into is it producing income or equity? Okay, check. All right. So like, let's take this, and this is what I was what I say to people too. It's like, all right, look at your deal, and it's great to put in you know realistic ideal numbers in there, but actually I would say, okay, well let's put in worst case scenario numbers, right? No matter what. Like let's say you know can we account for stress testing this deal if, if interest rates double in the next year, if uh, rents go down by twenty percent? Let's just say worst case scenario, am I still going to be breaking even or cash flow, or am I going to be negative cash flow, right? And even in that situation, if that happens, you know, and I'm okay with, you know, being break even, then okay, that's the worst case scenario. That's my bottom floor, right? I'll be okay with the upside, 
right? So that, and anytime that I'm in more of that scarcity mindset of like fear of that, say, I mean, I, again, I, I have it all the time. So too, um, I'll look at the numbers. I'll just go back to what I know. Numbers don't lie. Let me look at the numbers and say, all right, like, am I being irrational here of the fear or is this actually rational? Like, do I actually, should I be scared, right? Am I over leveraging? Am I, am I, you know, do I have enough cash reserves? But if you do have all that stuff, right? Then really what's, what is there to fear, right? The only thing to fear at that point is just your actual feeling of, of being scared about it, right? And so, I don't know, is that the help kind of like ease it a little bit or are you still um, feeling yeah, I just, because I was raised with that mentality, oh, you better pay off your mortgage as soon as possible, pay off yeah. all your debt. And when I look at my mortgage amounts with the primary residence and the rental property, I'm like, wow, this is kind of a large amount. And people that aren't real estate investors, when I told a couple of my friends, they're like horrified. They're like, oh my gosh, you need to sell some of that. Yeah, um, well, well I'll just get positive, right? Because you just yeah. said that, you said, well, my yeah. friends that are not real estate investors yeah. Yeah. are not doing this, are saying yeah. it, Yeah. Right? Well, they don't know, right? Like yeah, if you were know. to tell me, if you yeah. were to tell me, hey, Calvin, I got like $10 million of debt. I'd say, is it good debt? And you'd be like, yeah, they're all real estate, cash flowing assets. Yeah. I'd say, that's awesome, right? That probably means you own like $40 million of, of yeah. real estate, which is awesome, yeah. right? So, um, yeah, yeah, so if it's- yeah. Add, add to that as well, like you mentioned, like the friends, and we always say you're the average of the five people that you surround yourself with. So mm -hmm. you're surrounding yourself with people who are um, putting you down, oh, you should sell yeah. that, that's too much money, then you're yeah. gonna be that way too. But if you surround yourself with people who are thinking bigger of like, mm -hmm. like, are multimillionaires or like potentially like billionaires as well like you're going to be become a billionaire if you constantly surround yourself with billionaires yeah so just really shifting that mindset of like where is that fear coming from and just um my favorite quote is fear is the only thing that gets smaller the closer you get to face it um get to it so being able to face your fear and know like hey where is that coming from and that's why like a lot of the things like making data and logic decisions of um shifting that mindset shift of like okay it makes more sense of like of other people are making multi-millions we were able to do this in the last five six years to be able to build this portfolio it's just surrounding and how we did it was just surrounding ourselves with bigger thinkers as well too not like oh like that's too scary or uh, but it's like yeah this is great and like encouraging you to uplift yourself yeah and one more thing to add to Jenny's point. I mean, we were just in Austin, San Antonio uh, last week, and I got to visit one of my buddies out there uh, who flips homes. And I was like, flipping homes, that sounds pretty tough right now. But he, what he does is he actually, he actually does, uh, he actually creates manufactured homes, right? So in Austin, it, it's like $600 a square foot to build from ground up. But he's at, able to manufacture uh, homes uh, that look exactly, I, show you, I can show you a picture. It looks exactly like a normal home. And uh, he can build up for 120 bucks a square foot, right? So instead of saying, oh, I can't do it, economy is tough, he's figured out a way to say, you know what? Okay, economy will be tough, right? But I can actually buy land at really cheap and I can develop these at really cheap. And the quality is actually not bad at all, right? And he's, you know, gonna make $5 million this year on just those types of properties. So, you know, when people say, hey, I can't do it, I don't know how to do it. Well, then, you know, like Jenny said, look around you, right? Are, are the five people you're surrounding yourself with inspiring you, showing you different ways to look at things, or is it the cookie, or is it the friends that don't invest in real estate that say, "Oh my God, like you have a lot of debt, you should sell that," right? Like, um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, hope that helps. Yeah, um, I'm also, I guess, confused because I have, I get there's so much information. Like, I talk to people, a couple of people in the Bay Area, they're flipping and they're, you know, it's profitable for them. And then I have all these real estate agents from out of state, like from Indiana, Tennessee, yeah. Florida, sending me all the stuff. So now I'm like in, on information overload. So I don't really know what yeah. to do. Yeah. So Rebecca, have you ever seen the movie Up before? No. You haven't seen the movie Up? Okay. No. I'll give you a quick synopsis. There's a dog in this movie. It's a Pixar movie, Up. And he's like talking to someone. And then all of a sudden there's like a squirrel in the back. It's a like, squirrel, right? And he just kind of like looks around. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, you're right. In this day and age where information is, you know, flowing left and right, it's hard mm -hmm. to say what's actually the right move for, for me, right? And so what I say for you, Rebecca, is that everyone is different in terms of what they want out of real estate. So I would actually start at the end, right? Like, what is a real estate a vehicle for Rebecca for? Like, what are you trying to accomplish with it? Are you trying to become 
financially free so you can quit your job or you're trying to do, you know, uh, you're trying to just supplement your income, right? And what does that income look like? That, okay, so if that's the point, then let's reverse engineer it to say, all right, this is how much capital we have to invest. And then these are the types of properties that I should be going for that, that based off of my lifestyle, what my superpowers are, based on how much time I can commit, based on how much capital I can commit. These are the type of deals that actually makes most sense for me, right? Um, based off of my time and to get there. And so from that perspective, I would say, you know, what could be a good deal for me it could be a bad deal for you. It could be a bad deal for you. It could be a great deal for me, right? We're all different people looking for different things. And so don't be, you know, it's hard to obviously, you know, block off the noise, but do your best to block off the noise and figure out for you. And I'd be happy to have a call with you to help you figure this out too. Of like what streamline of like, what, what, what is the thing that I need to do in my life, right? To get to where I'm at. Like there's could be, there could be flipping, there could be manufactured mm -hmm. homes, self-storage. doesn't mean it's right for you. It's a shiny object syndrome, but what is the right thing for Rebecca that's actually going to move the needle for you and actually, you know, get you juice up because at the end of the day, this should be fun too. This is real estate shouldn't be a drag. It should be something that yeah. is exciting and fun and, and uh, also makes you money, right? It's passion income, not just passive income too. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That was helpful. Of course. Of course. These are things that we go over in Zen Coast University, just to reiterate, Calvin's been an amazing coach and we have a lot of great coaches who will guide you. And one of our favorite exercises to start off with our students is what is your vivid vision? And we look three years from now, let's say it's May 17th, 2026. Where are you? What have you accomplished? What have you done for your family? Where have you traveled? What food are you eating? Like all these things, that's what we work through with our students to be able to really visualize and create a roadmap. Like a lot of people plan for their vacations like one week of the year, but they're not planning for the other 50 or 51 weeks of the year. So that's where it's like, we're able to help you plan for your whole life for the next three years and your lifetime so that you know that you're gonna leave a massive impact through passive income. All right, who's Juice? We still announced paralysis? All right, Rebecca, you're gonna hit me up. We gotta talk through what their next deal is and what that looks like, get you focused on everything. I think hopefully everyone too. Ryan, I'm, I know I'm talking to you tomorrow anyways, so I can't wait for that. Um, well then, let's, let's keep on rock and rolling, guys. Um, can't wait to see you guys on the next one. And please reach out if you guys ever have any questions, I'm always available. Uh, same with Jenny. So thanks for coming out tonight. Have a great night.